This is Barry Zalma speaking for Claim School Incorporated with another story of a true crimes of insurance fraud. This, number 25, is the welcome fire. I present these videos so you can learn how insurance fraud is perpetrated and what is necessary to deter or defeat insurance fraud. The insureds had wealth. He was a successful lawyer and she owned and operated a chain of chiropractic clinics. They lived in Marin County in a multi-million dollar home. They had two small children who excelled at school. They entertained frequently. They contributed to political campaigns, the governor state senators, members of Congress, and U.S. senators stayed at their home as honored guests. Insurance fraud was not in their vocabulary. It was a crime committed by people below the insured's social status. The insured's venture into crime began innocently. They discovered on a family outing a one-acre lot atop a hill overlooking the San Francisco Bay. Its owner had recently died. The executor needed to sell the land to pay taxes. They could steal the lot for only $2,750,000. Finally, they could build their dream home. They were both fans of Gone with the Wind. They decided to build their own Marin County version of Tara. They met with an architect and negotiated a contract. He would design a 20,000-square-foot, three-story dwelling modeled on the southern mansion depicted in the motion picture. Unlike Tara, however, the mansion would have every modern convenience. It would have a basement with a full racquetball court, a sauna, an exercise room, and a 15-by-30-foot temperature-controlled wine cellar. Alarm devices were wired into every door and window. The alarms reported it silently to a central station. Two massive 20-foot oak doors would open on a grand entry with a 30-foot ceiling topped by a dome. They would cover the entire dome in hand-carved plaster acanthus leaves in an intricate design. A massive spiral staircase would gracefully lead to the upper stories with a master bedroom that occupied one wing and the children's bedrooms in the opposite wing. Under the staircase would be a fully equipped bar as intricately carved and equipped as the Redwood Room of the Four Seasons Clift Hotel in San Francisco. The house had a full library, a billiard room, a family room, and a dining room that could easily sit 30 people at dinner. The kitchen with copper ceilings contained nothing but professional equipment equal to the best gourmet restaurants in San Francisco. It was to be the grandest home in the entire Bay Area. The lawyer's sister, only a year before, had built a 15,000-square-foot mansion in the Oakland Hills. The contractor impressed the insureds with his attention to detail. They consulted with him about the building of their dream home, and after reviewing the plans, the contractor advised that he could build their house in 12 months for only $4 million. Negotiations began. The lawyer, by training and practice, could not accept the first offer. He knew that the contractor was building into his estimate at least a 40% profit margin. The lawyer knew he could do better. The contractor stuck to his price. He knew dealing with wealthy people in their dream homes always resulted in problems. The 40% profit margin was necessary to cover the problems and changes that would invariably occur as continu construction continued. The lawyer found the contractor's level of comfort. It was the risk that the contractor did not wish to take. The lawyer suggested that the insureds could be owner-contractors. The contractor would only act as their job superintendent. The owners would pay him a fee of $250,000 to supervise one year's work. The owners could contract directly with each subcontractor based on the recommendations of the contractor. 
he would have no risk. The contractor agreed to deal and construction began. The lawyer was not an easy man to deal with. He negotiated each subcontract based on competitive bids. He paid each subcontractor percentages of the work until the work was completed. When the work was completed, the lawyer refused to pay the 10% holdback. When the subcontractors threatened to place a lien on the property, he filed suit alleging negligent construction, breach of contract, and other damages. He informed each contractor that unless they waived the retention amount, he would keep them in the courts for five years. When the contractors went to a local lawyer to pursue their right and defend the lawyer's lawsuit, they found that the cost of defense exceeded what they hoped to recover. They decided to settle. Each withdrew his claim of a lien in exchange for dismissal of the lawyer's lawsuit. They promised that they would never deal with an owner-contractor again. The wife's chiropractic practice received a great deal of cash as payment for her services. She did not report the cash as income to the IRS. It was used to purchase materials. The insureds recorded brick and concrete in the books of her chiropractic practice and the law practice as office expenses. The cost of the house began to escalate. The lawyer's technique of dealing with subcontractors who had finished portions of the dwelling became common knowledge to the other subcontractors. They began to cut corners to make up for the losses they knew would be forced to uh, be absorbed by the lawyer's negotiating technique. Fewer men worked on the job. The construction moved at a snail's pace. The columns that the original plans described as marble changed. To save expense, the columns were made from molded fiberglass tubes filled with a slurry of concrete and vermiculite. The columns were topped with molded fiberglass and decorations, all of which were painted to look like real green marble. The insureds replaced the decorative stonework on the outside of the building with imitation stone made from hollow cast concrete. The basic structure was frame and stucco covered with a veneer. The designed slate roof was replaced with a lightweight concrete tile. Where the architect called for lath and plaster walls, they used half-inch sheetrock with a sprayed texture. A factory-made injection molded plastic ball and dark molding glued and nailed to the walls and ceilings was substituted for hand-carved molding. The luxury home, designed by the architect as built, appeared more a motion picture set than a real structure. With the first rain, the racquetball court became an indoor pool. Water seeped through the concrete block walls of the basement. The owners had allowed only one layer of waterproofing to the exterior. They also refused to install the sump pump designed for the basement. Walls were not built plumb. The builder cut and strapped headers over the doors. The subcontractors, rather than performing to their best ability, took pains to find ways to damage the structure. By the time the structure was 90% complete, the contractor and the insureds knew that it was a catastrophe about to happen. Although the house looked impressive on the surface, the interior was rotten. The contractor met with the lawyer and the chiropractor, and the contractor told them that the cost-cutting and maltreatment of the subcontractors had caused them to have a home built below reasonable standards. If a building inspector looked closely, they might not even obtain a certificate of occupancy. He was unsure whether the subcontractors would even finish the job because of the animosity engendered by the lawyers in negotiating techniques. The contractor's 12 months were up. He had completed his portion of the contract. The house was not finished, but he refused to con continue as construction supervisor. The insureds got half the 10% of his contract they held back. The job had been too much of a problem for him. It just wasn't worth the money. He told them the only way they would get the house they wanted was if it burned to the ground and they started all over. 
Two weeks later, the insureds flew to Hawaii for a chiropractic convention. On their return, as they were driving to their home, they noticed fire engines rushing up the hill toward the area where the building, their new house, sat. The chiropractor said to her lawyer husband, could it possibly be our house? They did not know. They decided at nine in the evening, after a long flight from Honolulu, to follow the fire engines up the hill, and they discovered that it was their house under construction on fire. The insureds claimed they were devastated. Their dream home was on fire. The firefighters were exceptional. One team ran in through the front entrance and immediately extinguished the flame on the first floor using only 200 gallons of water. A second team pulled hoses up the massive staircase and extinguished what fire had reached the second floor. The fire captain immediately called fire cause investigators. When the fire was out, the firefighters noted there were five separate areas of the house where fire had started and not connected. Someone had squeezed a flammable liquid under five separate sets of French doors along the west wing of the house and then ignited each separately. None of the five separate starts joined with the other. Only the fire in the library, covered with dry, unfinished oak, burned. One poured on the back marble floor burned itself out once the flammable liquid was gone. The others never gathered power because of the lack of fuel. The insureds with the investigator from the arson unit walked through their dream house. They seemed to be in shock. They found scrawled on one wall the words, quote, rotten shyster and quack. They could give no hints to the arson investigator who might wish to cause a fire at the house. They did not destroy the house. The firefighters showed the insureds where the fire was about to enter the attic. They informed the insureds that if the fire had reached the attic space, it would have burned the house to the ground. The investigators explained there were no fire stops in the attic as required by the building code. The drywall and the fast-acting firefighters prevented the total destruction of their house. The insureds were inconsolable. They were secretly upset that the fire did not destroy the house so they could start again on the insurance company's money. The insurance company was on the scene the next morning. Its fire caused an origin investigators videotaped the area of origin and took hundreds of photographs. The adjuster tried to ease the concern of the insureds. He called being the most experienced fire reconstruction contractor in the entire San Francisco Bay Area. Estimates were immediately prepared for repairing the fire damage. They returned the adjuster's kindness with animosity. The lawyer, upon first meeting the adjuster, informed them that he had trained with Melvin Belli and would stand for nothing but the utmost good faith. He informed the adjuster he was a good friend of William Chernoff in Claremont, a very famous insurance bad faith lawyer. If the adjuster did anything other than satisfy the lawyer, he could expect an immediate bad faith lawsuit. The adjuster took these statements in good faith, understanding that when a criminal attacks one's property, it causes even the most reasonable of people to act strangely. He assured the lawyer that it was company's policy to always treat its insureds with the utmost good faith and to resolve all disputes in the insured's favor. The lawyer stated an instant dislike for the fire reconstruction contractor. He informed the adjuster of the luxury accoutrements of the house and that no one was competent to build it other than their contractor. He brought the contractor back to do an estimate and the lawyer believed he knew that all insurance companies and all insurance adjusters made it a practice to reduce the amount recoverable under an insurance policy to the smallest number possible. The lawyer would not allow that to happen to him. He met with the contractor and instructed him to prepare an estimate for the fire reconstruction. 
The contractor was to write the estimate so the lawyer would have enough money to rebuild the entire house from the foundation up. The contractor pointed out to the lawyer that the fire had only damaged three rooms in the West Wing. The lawyer was undaunted. He said to the contractor, Go to each subcontractor. Tell them if they want to be paid for the work they have done, that they are to prepare fire reconstruction estimates twice what they would normally charge. Then when the insurance company cuts the estimates of the subcontractors, they will still be more than enough money left over to pay their fees. The lawyer also instructed the contractor to conclude in his professional opinion that all of the drywall in the entire house was destroyed because smoke touched it. This was a custom house. They were entitled to a new house, not a house with smoke covered with sealant and paint. They claimed they were entitled to the house design, not the house they had built. The contractor followed instructions. He dictated fire reconstruction estimates to each subcontractor. Those who refused to take his dictation, he forced to give him estimate forms signed in blank by the subcontractors. He then filled these estimate forms out, doubling the actual cost. He got a $300,000 painting estimate, though he knew that no painting had been done on the premises before the fire. He obtained a $150,000 estimate for replacing the library co cabinets, although the original cabinets had only cost $40,000. His final estimate totaled more than $4.5 million, an amount only $500,000 less than the amount they had spent to date to purchase the land and build the house. The adjuster received the contractor's estimate within two days. He called his fire reconstruction contractor, who was shocked. He thought his estimate, once he got all of the subcontractor's bids, would be no more than $250,000 to put the house back the way it was before the fire. The adjuster knew he would have a problem. The insureds informed the adjuster they would accept only the builder who constructed the house. They would never accept a fire reconstruction contractor tied to the insurer. The adjuster knew he could never agree with them on his own contractor's bid. He asked for and received from the insured's contractor all of his subcontractor bids. Rather than fight, the adjuster instructed his contractor to meet with each subcontractor. The contractor should obtain an agreement about the scope and amount of each subcontractor. He was to negotiate a settlement with each subcontractor. The contractor attempted to do so, but only six of the 20 subcontractors were willing to speak to the insurance company's fire reconstruction contractor. He did not know why the others would not talk. Those he did speak with allowed him to reduce the scope and cost claim to market costs. He reduced the amount of the insurance contractor's estimates to $750,000. The general contractor refused to accept the reductions negotiated with the subcontractors. He knew the general contractor told the insurance company's contractor that he would be charged extra to make up for these deductions. The insured would accept no less than $4.2 million. There was no room for negotiations. The insured demanded payment of $4.2 million and an additional $500,000 for loss of the use of the dwelling. They claimed to have a contract with a motion picture company to rent the dwelling at $25,000 a day, at least 30 days every year. The demands left the adjuster speechless. The demands and the reports of the contractor were taken to the claim committee. The claim committee decided it was obligated to resolve all disputes in favor of the insured. It could not accept the insurer-retained contractor's $250,000 estimate, though it appeared to be the most accurate estimate of the cost to repair the structure. Instead, the claim committee authorized the adjuster to negotiate a settlement with the insured up to $750,000.
They believed the insureds would be satisfied with the number the insurance company's contractor had negotiated with the subs, who would speak to it. They, they held a meeting in the lawyer's office with the lawyer, his wife, his contractor, the adjuster, and the insurance company contractor. The insured stood by their position adamantly. They threatened to sue the insurer for bad faith if it did not immediately hand over $4.2 million. The adjuster had no choice. He delivered to the insured a check for $750,000, which he described as the undisputed amount of loss. He immediately demanded appraisal arbitration according to the terms and conditions of the policy and named his appraiser. He told the insureds they could cash the $750,000 check without prejudice to the appraisal proceedings. The insureds left saying only, we'll see you in court. The insureds eventually appointed an appraiser, a well-respected public adjuster. They could not, however, agree on an umpire. They also insisted that because of the amount paid was paid as an undisputed amount, the appraisers were only to decide the difference between the 750000 paid and the insured's demands. The insurer retained counsel, who petitioned the court for an order compelling the appointment of an umpire. She also asked that according to California law, the court issue an order establishing that the appraisers are to find the total amount of loss and cannot be bound or influenced by the amount paid by the company. The insured's lawyers were furious. The insured's oppose, opposed the petition vigorously. They also filed a separate complaint in the Superior Court alleging bad faith and seeking punitive damages. Much to everyone's surprise, the court ruled for the insurance company. It concluded that the decision of the California Supreme Court in a case called Jefferson v. Superior Court, compelled the decision that appraisers must determine the amount of loss. Nothing more, nothing less. The appraisal, with the general contractor sitting as umpire, started a month later. The first witness called was the insurance company's contractor. He testified that he, if they had asked him to do a competitive estimate of the damage done by the fire, he would have estimated the repairs at $250,000. He testified his company could have done the work necessary to bring the building back to the same condition it was in just before the fire. The insurer's contractor explained that his company would do the work without any money paid in advance. He further testified that when his company was finished, it would keep between 30 and 40% of the $250,000 as profit. On cross-examination by the insured's bad faith lawyer, the insurance company's contractor maintained his position. He testified that he did negotiate with the subcontractors used by the insureds and obtained their agreement to come down from their $1.2 million original bids to $750,000 as an agreed plot price. He explained to the appraisers that he did not consider that negotiated figure to be a competitive estimate. Rather, he explained his surprise at the instructions that he received from the insurer to prepare a report relying on the insured subcontractors. The insurer's contractor stated his opinion that the subcontractors' estimates were excessive. He explained to the insurance company before they made a payment that $750,000 was not a fair or competitive estimate. The insurer told him that it wished to give every benefit of the doubt to the insureds and preferred to satisfy the insureds by using their own contractors. Counsel for the insureds frustrated his inability to make the insurance company's contractor waver from his testimony accused him of committing insurance fraud. Counsel for the insured stated by testifying that the loss by fire was $250,000. After preparing a report to the insurance company that he had negotiated a $750,000 price with the insured subcontractors was fraud. After a luncheon break, the three appraisers an independent adjuster, a public adjuster, and a contractor, none of whom had any legal experience, 
returned ashen-faced. They announced they would not proceed with the appraisal unless all parties were willing to release them personally of any liability as a result of the appraisal. The appraisers demanded the parties waive any potential conflicts that might exist, since each had received during his career some income from the insurance company. Counsel for the insurance company agreed on the record to the waivers and releases requested. Counsel for the insureds refused. The appraisers then recused themselves and refused to go further with the appraisal. They stopped the appraisal and refused to go further, resigned as appraisers, and it became necessary for each party to choose new appraisers. Eventually, with much argument and litigation and appellate proceedings, a new appraisal panel was created and evidence was taken again. One year and six months after the fire, the second appraisal started with a five-day estimate. Testimony began with the insured's witnesses and they called everyone involved in the fire reconstruction, which they had completed by the time the second appraisal hearing started and an expert general contractor. They presented two linear feet of documentation as exhibits, showing every penny spent on the construction of the dwelling and the fire reconstruction. When they were done, after 27 full days of presentation of evidence and cross-examination, the final expert concluded that their cost to repair all of the fire damage was not $4.2 million as originally presented on their proof of loss, but really 5.4 million. They called an economist to testify concerning the loss of use. He concluded based on his expertise, the loss of use of the money invested in the house, if not delayed by the fire, would have earned the insurance half a million dollars. Their claim upon the close of evidence was $5.9 million. The insurer then presented its evidence. It called a carpenter who superintended all fire repairs. The insured's contractor had demanded the same pay for the fire repair as he received for the original construction, and the insured's believing they could do the fire repair better than the contractor decided to be their own contractor again and paid the carpenter $25 an hour to supervise the trades. The carpenter was a graduate of Loyola University. He had trained under Jesuits. He had a moral sense and was racked with guilt. He admitted working with the insureds and their counsel and presenting the documentation to establish the amount actually spent on fire repairs. He did not want to lie and place his ex-employers in any difficulty. He therefore, for three days of cross-examination, provided almost no information. Every clear answer he gave came only after the same question was asked at least four times in four different ways. Counsel for the insurance company, the day before he was to finish the cross-examination, received a telephone call from the witness who told her, I must tell the appraisers why I have been such a difficult witness. Counsel explained that that was not a proper question to ask, but when she finished, her cross-examination, she would give the witness the opportunity to tell the appraisers anything he wanted. Appraisal being informal and not bound by the rules of civil procedure found in a trial allowed for narrative responses that could not be heard in a trial in a court. Cross-examination completed the next day shortly after the lunch and recess. Counsel told the witness that she was done and that now was the time for the witness to tell the appraisers what it was he told her he wanted to tell them. The witness, with his head bowed, apologized to the appraisers for being less than forthcoming as a witness. He testified he did not answer all questions asked of him forthrightly because he was frightened. The insured, he testified, had threatened to destroy his new contracting business and to further do him physical harm. The witness testified he was frightened for his life. He testified, I couldn't live with myself anymore. That is why I wanted to talk to him. Counsel for the insureds on cross-examination recklessly asked, 
So what is the this that you say made it so you couldn't live with yourself anymore? The witness answered to the surprise of everyone in the room. The fraudulent insurance claim I helped your clients present. The witness then went on in detail to explain how he had obtained inflated of blank estimates from each subcontractor. He explained that he innocently believed the insured, a lawyer, when the lawyer told him getting the inflated bills was necessary so the insurance company could cut them down. He was shocked when he learned the insurance company did not cut the estimates. He named names. After 10 minutes of detailed testimony on how he helped perpetrate a fraud, it had become apparent to the civil lawyers involved that the witness had admitted to a crime on the record under oath. He had admitted he had aided and abetted the presentation of a fraudulent insurance claim, a felony in California, punishable by as much as five years in jail. They excused the witness from the room, and the appraisers, the umpire, and counsel agreed that the umpire, a retired judge, should advise the witness of his right under the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution. The witness listened carefully to the judge's advice. He took the advice and he informed the judge he did not wish to speak any further. He wanted to seek the advice of counsel. The witness was ordered to return at the next hearing date with counsel, and he did so, and exercised his rights under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, not to testify in any way that might incriminate him. The retired judge, faced with the insurance counsel's inability to cross-examine the witness fully on his fraud charges, struck from the record all testimony concerning fraud. Over the next 10 days of sworn testimony, counsel for the insurance company subpoenaed and brought in the testimony of every subcontractor who the witness had named as involved in the fraud, and each confirmed the testimony of the contractor witness. Each admitted they were threatened by not being paid for work they had already done if they did not prepare an inflated estimate. One estimate for over $120,000 in cabinetry was dictated by the job superintendent to the contractor. The subcontractor testified the work was never done. He testified he never expected it to be done. The document was prepared only because the job superintendent would give the contractor no peace until it was given. The cabinet maker had no idea that an insurance company would rely on the quotation. Each subcontractor who provided testimony testified they received no benefit from the fraud. They claimed that the insured only paid them that which they owed them after they provided the false estimates. In fact, they were not paid the full amount the insureds owed them. The arbitrators advised each of the subcontractors of his Fifth Amendment right, and each waived those rights knowingly rather than allow the insureds to make a profit out of the fire. The insurance company brought to testify experts who established the damage claimed to result from the fire really occurred because of the lack of waterproofing on the basement walls, that mildew had existed on the premises before the fire and could not possibly have been caused by the fire or firefighting efforts, that work that the insured demanded by skilled craftsmen had originally been done by $5 an hour illegal alien laborers. The original painter who painted the premises before the fire testified he did all of the pre-fire painting of the entire house inside and out for $40,000 and could do so again. When asked his opinion of the $300,000 painting estimate, the painter laughed. As witness after witness testified that the claim fire damage did not exist or was inflated, the insureds and their counsel became desperate. They charged counsel for the insurance company with suborning perjury. They served subpoenas on counsel for the insurance company. They called her to testify concerning payments made to witnesses. Each accusation was shown to be false. Finally, after 40 days of sworn testimony, final arguments were submitted to the appraisers. Counsel for the insured argued that the expert testimony he had presented compelled the appraisers to find 
$2.4 million in building loss and an additional half million in loss of use through the house had never been occupied by the insureds before the fire, nor had it ever been certified for occupancy by the County of Marin. Counsel for the insurance company argued on the contrary and reiterated that the testimony of the individuals who actually worked on the house, and based on that testimony of an expert construction consultant using unit costs documented as appropriate for luxury class dwellings in Marin County, the fire cost a loss of no more than $250,000. Council further argued that since they neither occupied the house nor rented or held the house out for rental before the fire, there could be no loss of use. The arbitrators then retired to deliberate. The appraisers deliberated for two weeks. Documents passed between them. Proposals high and low went across fax machines and by email. They met in person three times. The appraiser for the insureds gave copies of the various communications to counsel for the insureds. The appraiser for the insurer refused to divulge any of the deliberations, as he was required to do as a quasi-judicial officer. Their awards, signed unanimously by all three appraisers, found that the damage to the dwelling by the fire giving every reasonable doubt to the insured was $400,000. They found that loss of use because it took at least two more months to finish the structure was $50,000, the fair rental value of the structure for two months. The award was less than the amount already paid by the insurer as an undisputed amount. The insureds were furious their bad faith lawsuit against the insurance company for failing to pay promptly the amount reasonably owed for the fire repairs seemed to be destroyed. They had only one choice. They must do something to cause the award of the appraisers to be set aside. But California law only allows three grounds for setting aside an appraisal arbitration award. One, fraud. Two, collusion or corruption of the arbitrators, or three, the use of the wrong measure in determining damages. Since the award only showed the dollar amount, the last of the three methods did not exist. They could not accuse the retired judge of fraud or corruption, since his credentials were impeccable. They had no information to establish that the appraiser appointed by the insurance company had done anything false or fraudulent. All they had were letters from their own appraiser begging that they pay his fees that were by the time of the arbitration hearing ended and deliberations began over $60,000 in arrears. While defending the eventual bad faith lawsuit, counsel moved the court to give the job superintendent immunity. This was only possible if the district attorney or some other prosecutor intended to prosecute it. The prosecutor announced his intent to prosecute and the motion for immunity was denied. No prosecution was forthcoming. The district attorney sought assistance from the insurance company and was given all assistance required. The district attorney only would tell the insurance company he was interested in prosecuting both the insureds and the job superintendent, but years went by with no prosecution. The bad faith lawsuit continued. The insurance company's expenses continued to grow and settlement negotiations were open and the case eventually settled. They allowed the insureds to keep the extra $300,000 over the award. Both parties paid their respective attorneys and the case was finally closed. The insureds succeeded in their fraud. They did not succeed as they wished, but they succeeded. The insurance company and all its customers lost. To even partially defeat this fraud, the insurance company spent more than it would have spent to pay the initial demand. It stood on principle until principle became too expensive. The lethargy of the court system frustrated it, since it allowed the bad faith lawsuit to continue even after the appraisal award showed the insurer had overpaid the claim. The insurers succumbed to settlement negotiations because of frustration in the criminal justice system. 
that have refused to accept that it is a crime to steal from an insurance company. The insurance company will think twice before it disputes a claim with an insured. The insurance company will refuse to believe the next time a prosecutor tells them that he intends to prosecute insurance fraud counts against the insured. The next person who attempts a fraud against this insurance company will find his job easy and profitable. This video was adapted from my book, Insurance Fraud Costs Everyone, which is available as both a Kindle book and as a paperback. Thank you for your attention.